What's up guys, Sean the Bro here, and today we're going to be going over forced palette swap if the characters are the same. So for example, if we are both mutant and skin one, when we go into the game, then the second character will have some sort of other thing applied to them. You can see they're not exactly the same skin. Now, you can do this however you want. Um, I'm currently playing around with what I want it to actually look like. This one is probably not going to fly because I don't know if this would look good on all characters. It looks all right here. But, yeah, the, the long story short, it doesn't really matter how it looks in this case. And I'm just going to be showing you how to do it. There's two really important things here. So th this first part, sure, it's not super important. You know, you might not even want this behavior. But there is something important about this episode that could be really useful. And I know you guys are going to do a lot with so there is something called a uh, dynamic material, which is basically when you have a vector parameter in a material, then you can set this value in another blueprint and change how this material looks. So we'll get into this in a minute, but this is super important because this allows you to change materials on the fly. You can actually change it over time. You can change it based on other parameters. And this becomes very useful very quickly. So this can eliminate a lot of the extra work we were doing to switch between different materials and all these other things. Now, if you still want a super unique material that, you know, is it's a custom material that you imported, then you're probably going to want to still switch to it because it's still useful to uh, be able to just do that. So long story short, we're going to basically get into what I would consider palette swapping today. It's not really the same thing since these aren't sprites. Um, and we don't have these these palettes in here. We're just using the different materials. But I call it palette swapping because I think of the way that certain fighting games did it, particularly older ones, where if you are the same character and the same you know skin outfit, then it applies like a lighter effect to the second player, just to show that you are unique. And I like that effect, and I wanted to show you guys uh, how we could handle it and different things like that. So first things first, let's actually go into the materials and check this out. This is episode 82, so if you want to catch up and check out everything we've done for this series, then I'll leave links uh, links to the iCards right here, top right corner, one to the playlist, and one to the uh, character skin and you know changing the uh, costume. Because that one, we are going to use a few of the things we used in there. We're going to use specifically um, two of the variables that determine what uh, outfit is going to be on our character or what costume, what skin, whatever, is going to be on our character. And that is important that we use those for today. However, it should be simple enough to follow along. If you just want to watch this episode, I'll do my best to cover everything that is required. So... First of all, if you go into your materials, and you'll want to do this for every material that you have that you want this to apply for, assuming that you want it for every character, then uh, every character and every skin, then you're going to want to do this for, you guessed it, every character and every skin. So I have, I'm mainly just worrying about the mutant for right now, but I have the mutant and the mutant second skin, which is that gray skin. And what I've done is my texture before I actually have a different one that I could show you um, if I could find it I actually have um, a copy here so you can see what the material look like on its own we haven't done a lot with materials in the series or any of my tutorials as of yet so I wanted to kind of show you this is what it looks like normally um, whether you open it up a lot or not this is what the a lot of the, your mixed mode characters will look like it'll have a texture sample for the colors and basically everything that you see on the character. And I'll have this thing that is essentially a normal map and they will be brought into the correct spot. So the color is gonna go into the base color slot and the normal is gonna go into the normal slot on the material. And it's that simple. You know, there's a lot more behind the scenes, but that's good enough for now for understanding it. Now, let's go to the new one. It looks like this. I moved the texture sample with the color back. I've kept the normal here. And I've just added this palette color parameter. And we can change this palette color parameter to change the effect of this. So I'm doing something called a blend lighten, but this isn't really all that important. This is just going to be some sort of way to combine these two things. So let's go over the palette color, and then I'll go over some basics of these material things and what we can actually do to make them look nicer. 
So first of all, this parameter that you see is not called palette color. Unlike a lot of nodes in uh, the in blueprints, this one is one <laughs> that if you don't know, you'll be looking for it for a while. This is called a vector parameter. So the way you get this is you right click in here and you type vector and it's right here, parameter. And then you give it a name. So I called it palette color. As I explained earlier, it's not exactly a palette, but you can call it whatever you want. Um, if you are doing a sprite based game with materials, you actually still can do this perfectly fine. So you can call it whatever you want. For me, I'm going to call it palette color. You just change the name right here in the parameter name. You don't have to give it defaults. If you give it defaults, it'll be overwritten anyway, but you can give it a default and check what it looks like. The only problem with that is if you do give it a default and leave it, then, well, your character will adopt that change in the game. Unless you specify the palette color to be, you know, 0000. zero, zero, zero. So, for example, if I make it one on the red, and we'll have to give it one on the alpha so it's not transparent, it will blend these two together, and then you will get this red mutant. And, you know, you can change this as much as you want. For me, what I did is I left it all defaults by, uh, by default, and then in the character, we'll adjust the character, the colors that we want. And the last thing I'm doing is I'm still bringing this stuff into the base color, but I'm combining them together. Here I was using Blend Lighten. This doesn't matter in this case. It, I mean, it definitely will matter, but it's up to you how you want it to look. So for me, I, I've been playing around with a bit. So, you know, if you want to do a different one, just, just look at these things. They're on the right side, too. You see where it says Palette, this tab. You have all of these options. There's a lot of blends, which I think will be useful. Overlay is a pretty good one and essentially blends these two together. I do have an episode planned for materials and more advanced things, like we've done um, an X attack or like some sort of shadow attack, and we have some materials that go over the character to spice things up a bit, but I'm not going to get into all that today. So basically just know this blends these two things together. You can look at the comments. It'll usually be pretty helpful in this. The materials are commented pretty well. And then bring the result in the base color. Now, again, you can test it here by changing colors. So if I do this, then I can see what the overlay will look like. But it's up to you. Okay. And you can change it for every material if you wanted. For example, this gray one that I have is basically just losing the blue color. That's all it is. I have green on the metallic. So you can do whatever you want with these. You can make them as crazy or as simple as you want. I can do a blend overlay here if I'm doing it in the other one and pass it a different color. I could pass it the green if I want it. I'm going to pass it the red to stay consistent. But you can see how it doesn't really matter. I, I have all the freedom here. for I can change whatever I want. And I can combine these colors whenever I want and pass them into the different fields here to make the final material. Regardless, let's get into the actual logic today. It's pretty simple, but it is important that we cover it all. So first things first, um, in our base character BP, I have made a function called change palette, which is where the actual logic occurs for uh, changing the material with this new vector parameter. But before we get into that, we have to figure out when we want to use this. So you could use this without swapping materials. In my event graph, I have this event called change character skin, and I was setting materials based on um, the skin index. Now the skin index was a variable I had in the blueprint, by the way. I actually made this variable in the fighter template character .h in the code file, current skin of the character. It's the exact same thing. I didn't change anything. I just moved it to the character.h because of the fact that I, I might want to be able to access this in code for multiple reasons that we can talk about in future episodes and I thought now would be a good time to do it if you don't want to do this it makes very little difference it will just require you to cast in the later blueprint to be the the base character bp as opposed to the fighter template character 
that's very simple logic wise but I moved it in here and I set it to be zero by default that's always the default skin now everywhere else where it is set um, it is set for the game instance other than in the base character BP when we receive it which since base character BP is a child of the fighter template character dot H well of fighter template character class then it makes virtually no difference just make sure if you do go ahead and move that to the code that you remove the skin index from here you don't need to it'll probably change the name if you leave it so say you had skin index in here you add skin index to the code this will be skin index zero now in the blueprint so make sure you delete that and clean up any references it's very simple you can just click on skin index find references and replace i have four just replace these four with the code one uh, these X attack things are things that I'm setting up for the future, so don't worry about them. And there you go. So that's the minor change that I made. Now let's go ahead and make this work. So the way I want this to work, again, is if, we have, if we're the same character and we have the same skin on, I just want to apply a small adjustment, small filter to make it um, look a little bit different so we can tell the characters apart. One thing that the, the best way that I thought to do this was in the game mode. You see, I have begin play. I spawn our characters. And then we called change character skin for player one and player two based on the skin index that was selected during the character selection menu. Well, that's good. And that works. We want to, if we're going to change the skin, we want to know if we should force one of the skins to have that extra adjustment. So what I've done is I've made a function in the default game mode BP called determine force palette adjust or de determine force adjust palette, whatever you want to call it. Basically, I, I like the word force here because it's saying, you know, this is this is not something the user picks. We do this just to differentiate the characters a bit. It's always an effect that I enjoyed. And I feel like just having the having them forced to be that means they could never be the exact same character. So it doesn't get confusing. And it's a little bit easier for people watching as well. But call this whatever you want. Basically, this just determines if we're going to make that adjustment and use that vector parameter we made in the material. Now, um, in the function itself, so make a new function plus function. Once you do that, you'll name it whatever you want, and you'll be in this function tab. For this, all I've done is I've added a Boolean output parameter, and I've called it should adjust palette. And we're going to check if the character, the characters are equal to each other. So I've checked if player one character class is equal to player two character class. If they're not, then don't worry about adjusting the palette. If they are, we continue. And then we want to check if the game instance reference for P1 skin index and P2 skin index are equal to each other. If they're not, don't worry about adjusting. If they are, then adjust. So that's the quick version. Basically, um, for those that don't know the series, character class refers to our actual character. It's called character class because I think of it as like the mannequin, the mutant, whatever. But in reality, we have player one, player two, which by the way, we have is valid checks earlier on in this in the begin play for the game of BP. So these will be valid at this point if it reaches it. No need to check if they're valid. And I grab the character class from them. So remember, we're in the game mode. We have player one and player two variables. All right. Now, character class is an enum we have. And we want to make sure that the characters are the same character. We don't want to apply this if one's a mannequin and one's a mutant, but they both happen to be skin one. That wouldn't make sense. This is only meant to differentiate characters that are that would be exactly the same in appearance. So we get our character class for each of these we do equal enum and you can pick the type but there's no reason to do that here we just want to drag these in this again this will uh, return true if you know both characters are mutant both are mannequin both are vanguard both are whatever both are the same fighter then if it's false we want to do something called return node and when you add a return node, it will automatically add all your output parameters to it. And then you can select the result. Since the character classes were not matching here, there's no reason for us to uh, apply that vector parameter on the material. So we don't want to do it. 
All right. Now, we have our game instance reference again, which is checked for validity before we get here, so you don't have to check. And it has something on it called P1 skin index and P2 skin index. These are variables we made uh, in the other episode, in one of the character select screen episodes, so that we could transfer them between levels. These are both integers, and they essentially just represent what uh, character skin we are. So if the character has 20 outfits, 20 skins, and we are skin 5, well, that wouldn't make a difference if it was mutant and mannequin, but if they're both mutant, then skin 5 is going to be the same regardless. So if their characters are already the same, we reach this part, and if their skins are also the same, then we want to adjust the palette. So if it's false, add return node, don't adjust. If it's true, then add return node and do adjust. Now, there's something special I've done here as well. A lot of those games, they always want that to occur for player two, not player one. So what I've done is I've already changed character skin for player one right here. And then I call it Determine Force Palette Adjust. This is the function we just made. Now, I have this, this extra Boolean that I've added to this change character skin function. Change character skin is what we were using in our base character BP to perform the logic in the past. If we're skin one, skin two, what material should we put on? And that is a function that we set up in the basic function interface earlier in the series. However, wherever you made this function, basically you're just going to want to add a new Boolean to it. So I've added a new parameter to my change character skin function. And I've called it should adjust palette, just like I called it in the game mode function. This way, I can arbitrarily choose if I want to use it or not. For player one, when we're setting the player one's values in their, in their appearance, I just set it to where we should not adjust the palette, regardless of what this is. This means the result will always be applied to player two. So we were calling change character skin with player two right afterward. And I've passed in the return value when you add this boolean, it will automatically add this uh, should adjust palette at the end here. So I've passed this return value into the change character skin, which I've added to that function. So now, if they should adjust the palette, only when player 2 gets called, this will occur. The rest of this stuff is stuff I did after. However, uh, with some of the changes we made in the series after we put this in. I no longer need this delay, so I did put it to zero. Just a quick note. And now we're done with the game mode. The last thing we need to do is actually make the logic in the base character BP to change the color. So event change character skin. We already have all of this. Essentially what was happening here is this function got called. We were passing the outfit index for the skin index. We were setting the variable. And then we were doing a switch on it, which was determining the right material to add. And that's perfectly fine as is. We don't have to change it. But if we're going to do this slight palette adjustment, then we do need to be able to do this after the materials are set for player one and player two. Otherwise, if you don't do it in that order, then this will just get overwritten by the material anyway. All right. So one final function we need to make, if you make a new function in your base character BP, I call it change palette. You can call it whatever you want. And I gave it an input parameter of a Boolean. And I've also called that should adjust palette. So we basically passed it along three functions now. And should adjust palette is going to go from the change character skin directly into the change palette function. All right. And then in change palette, if the Boolean is true, then we do this. Otherwise, we do nothing. You don't technically have to do a branch here. You could actually not call the function if the Boolean was false. But I decided maybe you want to do something else if it's false. So I've, I've let it stay open for you. You can do whatever you like. But we perform a branch here. Very simple. And then off of that branch, we're going to do something called create dynamic material instance. Create dynamic material instance. And we want to use the mesh in this case. Our mesh is what has our material that we want. And if you want to be super sure, if you're not positive, 
then you can go to the mutant itself or the character itself. All right, so you can see that the mutant has actually changed a lot from that overlay node that I used. So that's probably not the one we're going to use either. I do like overlay, but on him, it just does not look too good. But regardless, my point still stands. So you can go into your character, into the mesh specifically. Um, and then it will show you the material slots. If you want to change multiple material slots, that's also perfectly reasonable here. For me, I'm keeping everything simple, and I only have one material that goes over the entire mutant. So at the current moment, I only need element index zero. So when I go into my uh, change palette function, then we, we use the mesh because the mesh is what has the material on it. The element index is element index zero. That's the material I'm trying to change. If you have a source material, it will always use this material as, well, the source. And the thing with that is, since we have multiple skins, like we have the regular mutant skin and the gray mutant skin, if I put a source material in here, then it would actually invalidate other skins that aren't this one. So this is good for consistency's sake, but it's not good if you want it to work for multiple skins like we do. I want this to be applied to every character, every skin. So I leave a uh, source material blank. You can see it says select asset because I have not selected anything. The optional name I've also left blank. And then we do one final thing we call set vector parameter value. So you can drag off the return value, call set vector parameter value. Parameter, this name has to match the name in the material. So for me, I called mine palette color. So whatever you see here, palette color, or whatever you see on this node, you can copy it directly if you want to be safe. You can also just type it in, not a big deal. Make sure you paste it here. And then you can choose the value, which is what you want this vector parameter to actually be. So right now, it's being set to just this default 0001. But you can change it to whatever you want. So in my case above, I've set it to be these values. If you want to copy them, you don't have to. And this is just a gray. Basically, if I'm doing the lighten function, this is going to apply like a gray material to it. We can try out some things here. Let's make it like a bright white, okay? Just like that. I'm gonna delete this stuff since we have a good example up above. All right, so I've played around with the colors a little bit here. So let's uh, let's take a look at this again with all the changes. So I've now made the palette color look like this. These are the specific values I'm using. Basically just this gray color, a little bit darker. Um, in fact, I'm probably gonna make it even a little bit darker based off what I just saw. Let's do it like that, okay? That'll be the final value we use for today. And then in the material itself, I've done a blend darken, forced the default colors of the palette color to be completely white, which is 1.0 and everything, which means the way darken works, it returns the darker of the two values for each pixel. So if this is completely white, then this will never be the darker value. At most, they'll be equal. And thus the original color is kept. You don't even have to use like bulls in here or anything in this case, it's just will automatically do it by the nature of how blend darken works. But then since the colors in the value in the set vector parameter value could be darker, then it can adjust and use those values. I haven't technically done this for this other one yet. But if we play the game and make sure they are both the same color, then you can see Again, the other character gets this darker version, which accomplishes what I wanted to accomplish. You can see if they switch sides, he's still darker. It's not a lighting thing. It's just a character thing, and it makes it look so much better. Being able to differentiate between the two characters automatically is something I very much enjoy. Now, as I said earlier, you can actually keep these separate. So blend lighten returns the lighter of the two values. Well, this is a dark outfit, and this only has red and green, just for the record. But in this case, we want Blend Lighten to do basically the opposite of what we're doing there, perhaps. It, it depends on the skin. You might want to do something else. So what we can do is leave the default as all zeros, right? Because this is Blend Lighten. So at most, if it's black, it'll be matching the defaults, not lighter than it. So always take this. And then when we go into... 
here, it's going to set the parameter value to this gray value. So we'll see what it looks like. But we have to change both of our characters to be the same character and the same skin. Then when we play it, you can see that it's lighter. Fight. Character two is lighter than character one. And so you can do this however you want. Feel free to play around with it. It doesn't matter. The rules are all up to you. But it is something that I thought was important. This is a feature I always enjoyed. And also it shows you kind of how you can start messing with materials a little bit more. All right, guys. So that's all I got for you today. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed, please subscribe. It does more for this channel than anything else you can do. And I just really appreciate it. I'm going to give a huge shout out to my YouTube membership and Patreon supporters. Thank you guys so much for all the love and support. I can't wait to continue this series. I'm getting so excited about what we're going to do next, which is the combo system. So I'm setting up uh, stun states and combo states for us to be able to use and play around with. That way we can actually start making this feel more like a fighting game. The main thing that I think we are missing right now is that sort of being able to just perform attacks you know, get the proper feedback and then continue because all of our attacks are kind of separated. We do have some attacks that are combos, but even at that, it's still a little bit separated, right? You do it and it feels good and there's no real way to follow it up. It's just not smooth enough at the moment. So we're going to be getting into all that stuff, that sort of combat flow pretty soon, and it's going to be pretty heavy. So sounds like a fun time to me. Anyway, guys, if you had any issues with this tutorial or any of my tutorials, feel free to join the Discord community where we'll help you out for free. And that's all I got for you. So thank you guys so much for watching. I'm Sean the Bro, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye, guys.